the body thrives under activity. And whether you take a human, whether you take an animal, if you essentially domesticate them and they are not training, they will lose muscle. You can only pull one lever. So if you, you have two levers, you have diet and you have muscle mass, which would you have somebody pull for longevity? You can have an amazing diet, but you have very little muscle mass. You don't uh, do a lot of exercising or you're like my swimmer friend and you have in just incredible output. You're exerting yourself tremendously. You have a great amount of lean body mass. We all know what swimmers look like. They look fantastic. Um, but your diet is a Twinkie diet, like you called it. Which of those two levers is going to be more impactful? Okay. So I'm going to tell you what the research shows, and then I'm going to tell you my personal experience. Word. So the research would say, hey, if you had to prioritize one over the other, prioritize resistance training. Okay. That being said, in clinical practice, I have absolutely never seen that work. If they prioritize dietary protein and they get that first meal right, by lunch they feel better. I'm not asking them to wait four weeks. You nail that first meal. By the second meal, you feel better. You want to deal with body composition. You want to deal with optimal aging. You want to overcome this concept of anabolic resistance, which we can talk about. The only and most effective, now again, this is my personal opinion, based on seeing hundreds and I think I've been at the bedside of hundreds of dying people. Geriatrics is no joke. Mm -hmm. And if I could pull the lever and go back in time, what would I tell them? You know, I would say you've got to do both. But when you're young, you have more flexibility and you can out train a bad diet. But as soon as those hormones begin to change, if you have low quality protein, and by the way, protein is utilized in a dose response. So it's a, a meal dosage. It's really a 30 to 50 gram meal dosing. So that's between four and you know five to six ounces of protein per meal. And if you go under under that, you are below what's called this leucine threshold. And I, I want to make this very palatable for people. So basically, there's essential amino acids. And out of these essential amino acids, that's really what determines the quality of a person's diet and the quality of protein. So when they are sub-threshold of one particular amino acid, which is leucine, if you eat food that is sub-threshold to that two and a half grams of leucine, you will be skinny fat. You will never activate the proper mechanisms to turn over muscle protein synthesis. And this is a huge problem in our society. You know, there's nutrient sensors in the body. So hitting that particular amino acid load, which is really four to six ounces easy, and it's easy for people to anchor their meals in, you know, four to six ounces of protein, and then you stimulate your muscle tissue which we know is an endocrine organ. Let's talk about that. If you're not trying to bodybuild, if you're not trying to get bigger. Um, so I'm thinking, I know somebody, love her to death, she's amazing, but her diet is ridiculous, but she's skinny. Her whole family's skinny, it's crazy. And so I've always said, I guarantee if you look at her biomarker, she's gonna be skinny fat. She's gonna be probably pre-diabetic, judging by how she eats, it's you know pure yeah. insanity. Because I, I wanna differentiate between busting your ass in the gym and what you're gonna get from that and then just like, hey, even if you don't care about the gym, even if you don't buy into that, uh, right. there's just a quality of tissue issue. And if you think of it as an organ, it's like saying the quality of the tissue of your liver or your kidneys. It's yeah. like this shit yeah. matters. So if people could do one thing and leave this conversation with nothing else other than muscle is the organ of longevity and eat high quality protein, animal protein and plant protein are totally different. And if you have a diet of plant protein and is very hard to sustain and calorically devastating because you need between 25 and 40% more. So it's like six cups of quinoa for one small chicken breast. Mm -hmm. If you really wanted to think about the amino acids necessary to stimulate that tissue. And listen, that's not the only way to do it. Could we add in branched chain amino acids to lower quality protein? Absolutely. But why would you do that when we have you know, cattle or, or ruminants that ha that we've been consuming for two and a half million years and have the capacity to take low quality plant nutrition and produce high quality nutrition with that is 
nutrient dense and highly bioavailable for humans. So I understand, I've heard you say the same thing. Like I understand people have, they may have a, um, a moral desire to eat plant-based food. And I get that dude as somebody who's absolutely, I just love animals. And I long for the day where we can lab grow meat and that there was never an animal um, involved in that process. But I'm also just selfish enough to say, I'm going to protect my health. Um, yeah. You know, when you look at obviously sustainable farming and things like that, I'm all for it. I couldn't be more behind that. Um, but wanting to understand sort of at a mechanistic cellular level what's happening. And I don't care what the answer is, vegan, vegetarian, animal, a mix thereof. Um, I just want to understand like at a cellular level what's happening. Um, and to get that, I think understanding the what branch chain amino acids are, why they matter and how the profiles differ from plants to meat, I think would be really helpful. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. So really the quality of our diet and this is globally, the quality of our diet is largely dependent on protein. So there's 20 amino acids and nine of those are essential. Of those essential amino acids- And essential to, meaning I, I cannot produce it in my body. Exactly. So the key branch chain amino acids, and when you think about branch chain, it's just the structure, right? It's just a nomenclature. You've got leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And out of those three, which by the way, should all be consumed together because everything in life has its own balance. Of those three amino acids, leucine is the most relevant for protecting the organ of longevity. And on a cellular level, having the right amount at one time dosed appropriately, which is where that two and a half grams, that's, from the, that's just from research, you know, it's really, truthfully, it's between 1.8 to 2.5 grams of leucine, which the majority of people are not going to go, hmm, how much leucine is in my food, right? It's not on the back of a label, which just goes to show you how protein has been the black sheep of the macronutrient family for decades. When you look at a label, all it simply says is protein. But understanding on a cellular level that really eating protein at a meal-centric dosing, meaning you at one time, you're not drinking protein shakes over a course of two hours, but at one meal at a bolus amount, you are getting between 30 and 50 grams of protein, which would translate to between four and six ounces of high quality protein would reach that leucine threshold. So once you reach that leucine threshold, you trigger this, um, this complex called mTOR. mTOR is the mechanistic target of rapamycin, which then is actually a nutrient sensor. Anything below that, the body's like, mm, I don't care. I'm not going to put on muscle. Or mm, I don't care. I'm not going to really stimulate this very expensive, elaborate process for the body. It doesn't care. So that's where you get skinny fat because you're grazing all day at this low threshold meal, especially important in aging because you don't have that flexibility. And when I say aging, I'm talking about 40s. You know, mm -hmm. you've got to stay on top of it. But once you reach that threshold of arguably two and a half grams of leucine, which you could have a two ounces of fish and then a scoop of branch chain and get up that leucine level. But mechanistically, you need that branch chain, that essential amino acid, to then trigger the rest of what needs to happen for muscle protein synthesis. And listen, the way that they measure muscle protein synthesis it's not like you eat it and then you're laying down protein. It truly, I mean, that's not an accurate assessment, right? I would be um, not being truthful if I said that, but it really is a period of time, over a period of time as you continue to do with anything correct, optimized habits, you then can protect your tissue. And protecting tissue is everything. You know, and it's very dangerous because when people do weight loss, you know, you lose some fat, but you also lose tissue. And now we're in a situation where we're not outside and we're not doing resistance training and we're not actually moving that endocrine organ. So, you know, it becomes much more difficult to maintain and recoup that tissue. And the tissue is just one aspect. It's truly the metabolic aspects, you know, of, the, of muscle. And if you want to prevent diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular, you know, cardiovascular disease, that whole spectrum, 
tissue, you know, muscle tissue will do that for you. And then you put on high quality protein. You're going to keep inflammation low. You're going to keep calories in check. You're going to upregulate your thermal effect of feeding. These are all really important. You're going to do, you're going to have lower blood pressure because some of the amino acids, one in particular helps lower blood pressure. I mean, this is amazing stuff. It's a muscle centric approach to wellness and the paradigm is totally wrong. All right, my friend, I have a big announcement. My incredible and talented wife, Lisa, is about to launch her new book, Radical Confidence. In it, she has managed to perfectly capture the process of how to go from feeling lost and insecure to taking control of your life and doing amazing things despite feeling fear, sometimes a lot of fear. Now, let me tell you, nobody knows Lisa better than me, but when I read Radical Confidence for the first time and heard her describe what it was like for her to go from having these big Big, exciting dreams as a kid to then as an adult scheduling her life around the TV shows that she wanted to watch or how lonely and isolated she felt instead of pursuing her dreams it was brutal for me I would never say though that it was worth it for her to go through all of that just so that she could write something down that allows others to avoid it but I will say that at least she was able to capture the strategies that she used to break out of that rut find her voice and begin doing incredible things despite her insecurity and fears that she wasn't going to be good enough to achieve great things. So while it hurts me to know the dark place that Lisa went through, I really am excited for people who are going through something similar right now to read this book. Radical Confidence is an instruction manual for how to become the hero of your own life even when you're scared to death. Look, I know better than just about anybody how easy it is to get off track in life or to just not have yet found your calling. And it's even easier for people to feel so insecure and unprepared that they don't even want to pursue the things that they want. But what Lisa shows people in radical confidence is that the radical part is that you can accomplish extraordinary things even when you feel fear. That's what radical confidence is being afraid and unsure and having a toolkit that allows you to still make massive progress. Pre-order your copy today because if you act now, you can claim the bonuses that Lisa has created for you at RadicalConfidence.com. They're only available if you pre-order, so act now. Then, once you've done that, we'll get back to today's episode. All right, guys, read the book and get ready to be the hero of your own life. Peace out. When I started working out, you can actually feel just the difference in in a lot of things. You can feel the difference in mobility and strength and just overall well-being. Um, and then some of the data in terms of how people bounce back from long-term chronic illness. I know in the cancer community, one of the, the things they look at is when muscle mass gets too low, they're just like they're they are one illness away from demise. And same thing with old people. It's like, hey, you might be able to survive the flu if you've got enough muscle to see you through. Um, but if not, then you could really be in trouble. So it's interesting to hear that broken down. I, I want to go back to what you were saying about that first meal, um, which I think you're quite careful not to necessarily refer to it as breakfast, but your first meal, um, sure. getting getting that right. Um, I'd love to hear what right is like in the real world. Am I eating eggs? Am I eating chicken breast? Am I eating yes. quinoa? Like, what am I eating? <laughs> you are not eating. So if you get that first meal right, if your meal is bolus with protein, you do a few things. Number one, you stimulate your muscle tissue, which is arguably the most important organ, right? But number two, there, and there's really good data that it actually helps with satiation and blood sugar regulation. So you are not going to be chasing 90 minutes later your um, blood sugar. You are not going to be obsessed in your mind and not able to focus because you want to eat or you feel like you have to take a nap. Yeah, I, I encourage know? people to try to overeat um, steamed chicken breast. It's like, good Bro. luck. Like yeah. you, you will tap out long before you get obese. That is for sure. Um, so oh. what are, give me some ideal protein sources. Am I eating, yeah. is it chicken breast? Is it red meat? So we eat a lot of beef in our family, beef, bison, eggs. Uh, we are not a low fat family. So, you know, for breakfast for us might be half a pound of bison each with a little bit of olive oil and maybe some avocado. But we're low carb for that first meal. We tend to do carb backloading or if we're going to have carbohydrates, use carbohydrates around a meal. Now, my husband is a seal. So they, you know, they kind of like go crazy and train and then eat and train. That's, that's Navy SEAL for anybody wondering. <laughs> no, arguably he's probably an animal, but it's okay. Um, so that's how we, but the first meal is always the same. 
Why do you do carbs later in the day? That's interesting. Because you've been up and you've been utilizing your tissue. So you so depleted is, your muscle glycogen, essentially. I mean, listen, the, the, the data would show in a 24-hour period. So I want to be very careful to say this is my experience because the data will say, well, in a 24-hour period, how much carbohydrates are you utilizing? And I would say it's much easier to backload your carbohydrates or utilize them around training, perhaps post-workout. So I do believe that training low glycogen state is very beneficial. Do you work out fasted or do you have your first meal? I do. So I work out fasted. And Um, do you have a, a strategy behind why you do that? So I think the training low, I like my body to become very proficient and, and, and efficient on its own. I like to be able to make all the glucose I need, right? And because my diet is high in protein, there is what happens is it goes through gluconeogenesis. So truly for every hundred grams of protein that I eat, my body generates 60 grams of carbohydrates itself. So I am not reliant on quinoa for breakfast or carbohydrates. My body becomes so good at making and generating its own that it allows me to eat any carbohydrates in, you know, truthfully, I don't eat a bunch of carbs. It, when I work them in, it would be, you know, possibly if we had a really busy day, we have a little infant, you know, and we have no childcare. So we're just kind of, you know, busy and we're training. And, you know, if I've gone for a lot of training that day and I'm running around chasing her, I might have you know, and it's meal specific. So there's a carbohydrate threshold, which is how I like to think about carbohydrates. I might have, you know, 20 grams of some kind of carbohydrate in the evening. And, and truly the carbs that I love, and everybody says this are green leafy, you know, vegetables, but I really like things like cilantro and chives, things that maybe have more medicinal purposes. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we use. So, so herbs is medicine. Which ones, what effect? (laughs) I am certainly not an expert on herbs, but I will tell you one of the things that we use is, this isn't an herb, but I'm just very strategic. So like in the morning, I'll use something called Sun Up Green Coffee. And it's, it's this one company that I just really love and I have no connection to them, but they have a product that I think nobody knows about that everybody should. And it's raw green coffee. So it looks like tea. I don't make it. I get it. Clear like that. It, it, look, it tastes like tea and it really, and it has a high amount of polyphenols, which I know that there's a lot of debate in, but I believe in polyphenols. And what, has, what, does, what do the polyphenols do for you? So they're antioxidant. They have numerous effects, anti-cancer activity. And I will tell you that I am able to maintain my body composition by doing these very strategic things and just being very conscientious of utilizing simple tools that I have found incredibly helpful. Like for example, um, jalapenos, using raw jalapenos with capsaicin. You know, the whole goal is optimizing body composition. And you utilize these in an, you know, over a period of time in enough amounts and the body generates its own effect. And listen, this is totally subjective. You do have to control for calories, but there are things that we just as scientists or as practitioners, Physicians don't necessarily understand, but I can tell you that it works. So I use chlorogenic acid in the morning. I've never heard of that. What is it? That's the green coffee. That's why I use the green coffee. Chlorogenic acid? Yeah. Has high amounts of chlorogenic acid. You're going to try this. I've never heard those syllables put together before. (laughs) Chlorogenic acid. Okay. It's a compound that helps with fatty acid metabolism. Hmm. Very Um, interesting. Okay. So we have our green coffee. um, And then uh, what else are we doing in terms of... um, herbs um a lot of cilantro and they you know there's some belief and through what mechanism i don't know but very detoxifying you know a lot of individuals with quote heavy metals will utilize a cilantro based kind of compound cilantro parsley chives garlic people are like i'm not coming to your house it's all right but it, it would be interesting because i think that that's the you know i think we're all looking for ways to optimize longevity at the, not just at the end of life. So it doesn't really matter if you live to a hundred versus 105 or 95 to hundred, if the last five years suck, mm. right? So how do we live a way that surpasses what we've seen for longevity, but the quality 
of our life is together. And that's the question is not the length, right? So it's not quantity of life. It truly is quality towards the end. So really, I'm starting to experiment with these things as it relates to longevity and quality. Yeah, that's while interesting. Keeping- really fast. Give people a bit of a breakdown on your background in geriatrics. One, I don't know yeah. that everybody knows what geriatrics is. Um, right. And then two, I know you spent a lot of time in palliative care. So what that is and sort of the it's given you sort of a tough edge and no bullshit approach to this that yeah. I really respect. So first, what is geriatrics and palliative care? And then what have you learned from it? Yeah. And, and I'm going to tell you where muscle centric medicine came from. There was a turning point moment that was during my fellowship. Um, so geriatrics is really, it's taking care of aging and it's over the, it's 65 and older and that's what's considered geriatrics. And then palliative care is the end of life. So you are really at the end of your life, whether it's a month or so, and, and that's really transitioning to the other side, whatever that other side is. So when I did my fellowship at WashU, it was a two-year fellowship. And part of the deal was I was going to get to do nutritional sciences. So I've trained seven years in nutritional sciences. But the deal, the deal is in order to do clinical research, so I did two years of clinical research, part of the way that it worked was as a physician, I also had to have clinical duties. Part of those clinical duties, the agreement was, right, there's always a give and take, Um, the agreement was I got to do obesity medicine and run a weight loss clinic and, and image people's brains and be part of euglycemic clamps and do all this really rad stuff. But in order for me to do that, I had to take care of people in nursing homes at the end of life in the hospital and geriatrics. And I'm sure everybody, many people have had aging parents. It is not, I mean, Diseases of aging are heart crushing, bone sucking, like it is so harsh. And that's why I feel so passionate about this message because I've actually done the work and sat at the bedside of these people, you know, and at the end, at that moment in time, you can look back and, you know, people have a lot of regrets and I will never forget. And muscle centric medicine came from a very specific moment. Part of um, the research I was doing is I was imaging people's brains. It was obese brains, midlife, incredible women around, you know, late 40s, early 50s. And I have to change the name of this woman. So we'll call her Sarah. And Sarah was the nicest woman. And she had three kids. She had been overweight her whole life. And I'd sit with her, you know, we do 24-hour euglycemic clamps, sit with her. And you really get to know these people. You see them at multiple points in the study. And uh, one of the parts of the study was imaging her brain just to see what her brain looked like. And when we imaged her brain, she had a lot of like flattening of her matter and it came from midlife obesity. And we knew that within, you know, really 10 years down the line, she's going to have Alzheimer's. What is flattening of the matter? What is that? So the gray matter. Right? So that the brains, the, the wider the waistline, the lower the brain volume. So Alzheimer's, there are, ma- there are many, multiple different aspects of Alzheimer's, but Alzheimer's is type three diabetes of the brain. Mm. It's a metabolic illness that can be prevented just like diabetes, just like cardiovascular disease, just like hypertension. And listen, I, I want to say this with a little bit of reserve because there are genetic components. However, lifestyle, choices midlife, having access to the right information changes the trajectory of aging. I was so heartbroken when we reviewed her fMRI study. I was heartbroken because all she told me was, you know, I've emotionally eaten my whole life. I have three children. I'm a stay-at-home mom, and I put everybody first. And her habits were so deeply ingrained, and she was obese. Her muscle tissue wasn't there. She literally in the next decade was going to have Alzheimer's and she had no idea what she's in store for or what her family was in store for. And at that moment, I knew that chasing body fat was the wrong thing to do. It was all about muscle as this metabolic organ. And if she had turned her attention to protect against that, because it controls body composition, it's so metabolically the yeah. the bigger the waistline, the smaller the brain. Why? Yeah. What mechanistically is happening? Because it is very inflammatory. 
So there is insulin receptors in the brain. You know, it can affect the, br- the blood brain barrier. Insulin resistance in the body and insulin resistance in the brain. And one of the other things, and, and we'll talk about muscle, but the, the, the protein component affects satiety. So that overeating, that emotional eating, your body is going to feed until it gets the protein that it needs. And that's, that's, that's something super so, interesting looking at cravings from that perspective. Yeah. And it's actually called the protein, protein leverage hypothesis. Where, and this is well-maintained throughout species where they will feed. So you'll continue to eat and overeat and overeat if you're eating a low protein diet until you reach that protein need for these satiety mechanisms to shut itself off. Very troubling. So now <laughs> give me what does muscle do that interrupts that? Why is it anti-inflammatory? Like if we look at what I just laid out is how we get too much insulin into the system. What's muscle's role in? So muscle is the largest site for glucose disposal. Glucose in and of itself is cytotoxic. It is really critical to get glucose out of the bloodstream and take it up. One of the ways the largest site for disposal is actually muscle tissue. The more muscle you have, the more metabolically healthy it is, the more that it's actually utilizing nutrients appropriately, the more carbohydrate flexibility you actually have. So it's in and of itself protective. And we talked about when you, when you contract it by secreting myokines, it is anti-inflammatory. So if fat is the nemesis of muscle. Talk to me about what the muscles are secreting. Um, this isn't uh, interleukin-6 I'm familiar with only because of what's going on with coronavirus. So that sort of cytokine storms and stuff is that's become more um, people are talking about it more. Uh, but the other stuff, like what you just said, which I, I couldn't even tell you what you just said. Um, what's that called again? And why is it anti-inflammatory? So the interleukin-6 is really the big one. That's what muscle is famous for. But when you think about muscle tissue as it relates to inflammation and obesity and really protecting Sarah, the story that I told you, if she had been able to get her tissue under control just mechanistically from getting her protein intake up, right, and making sure that that tissue was emptied, but because she was largely inactive, and, you know, there's this, this concept where when the muscle is full, everything starts filling back into the tissue That's or it just can't get yeah. in. So basically you have an increase. Remember, there was this whole big discussion about branch chain, branch chain amino acids cause diabetes because everyone with elevated glucose also had elevated branch chain amino acids. I've never heard that before. Tell me more. There was some research that had come out where people had mistakenly said, well, those with elevated levels of branch chain amino acids, it correlates to high level, you know, it correlates to diabetes. Branch chain amino acids in the bloodstream. In the bloodstream. <laughs> Correct. And actually that's absolutely true, but not for the reason people think. The reason it was true is because branch chain amino acids are utilized by the muscle. Oh, but there's no- let me guess. So yeah. you're talk- this is that backup mechanism, right? So right. the branch chain amino acids should be going into the muscle, but they're wow. full. What are they full with? They're full with the glucose? No full of glucose, they're full of fat, they're full, they're just full, they can't accept any more substrate. Because they're not being used. Exactly. Now we're on to some now we're on to it. So these diseases of obesity, these diseases of being over fat, they're not diseases of being over fat. They are diseases of impaired muscle. So if you fix that muscle tissue, And that's through lifestyle, keeping inflammation low, keeping calories in check. And truly, we are domesticated as a planet. Can we define fix? So when we say fix, because if you had stopped shy of the word fixed, I would have said add more muscle, which is where I always expect you to go. Um, Is this a, a game of quantity and quality, primarily quality? Um, These, These are great questions. And I... I don't think anybody knows the answer. And here's why. Because muscle is the most underappreciated organ. We have percentages of body fat that we know are not great. But we don't know. I don't know what percent muscle mass you should be. You don't know what percent muscle mass I should be. And this is 
so important to understand because if we really truly want to help obesity, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, it's really about optimizing muscle tissue and, and nobody knows that answer. I would say from a professional opinion, quality and quantity matter. Of course, I'm not talking about in the extremes of, you know, a bodybuilder in the Olympia, although that's incredibly healthy tissue, right? Oh, can I tell you a secret? Here's something I would love to know. How does muscle mass correlate with um, surviving coronavirus? I thought I about that kind of early on and I thought, ooh, I do wonder. Well, if you think about it, the higher the muscle mass, the better the protection against all cause mortality yep. and morbidity. Just in That's general. Crazy. People need to let that one sink in across all cause mortality. I agree. So listen, if someone goes and they're on a vent or they're aging, I mean, what are the things that are going to be most important? Muscle tissue. You want to survive? You've got to be able to support your system. Yeah, man, it's crazy. Muscle, muscle, muscle. So now let's talk about how do we get some muscle? So obviously we need to eat. We need to get our leucine levels right. We need to eat a certain amount of protein, which I think you said roughly one gram per lean body mass. That's the recommended mass. amount. I actually, that's the, what is, would be considered in the literature, one gram per pound lean muscle mass. And I would say that's a great starting point. I would say it should be one gram per pound ideal body weight. Okay. So lean, lean muscle mass is very, very plus a little bit of fat. You're saying, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. Whatever you want. As long as so calories ballpark are park me, I'm 180 pounds. What so you should I grams of protein? 180. Yes, sir. Okay. And then, you know, what's your caloric target? We would, you know, I would probably break up your protein meals in 50 grams or so. Could you go over? Yeah. Would you have much metabolic benefit? No. So 50 grams of protein per meal. So seven times, you know, six would be 32 grams. So, I mean, brother, you're going to be eating a lot. Or if you didn't want to do that, you would have a lower dose of protein and then add in, add in your brown chain amino acids. So that's one strategy. And then you asked about fat. So fat is more, you know, for men, I like to keep them a minimum of 80 grams for hormone production. So I would say a minimum of 80 grams of fat. But again, this is all based on calories. And carbohydrates, eh, take it or leave it. And I'll tell you what is more important is also as you age and we all become more mature, hate to admit that I'm aging, but we are, is that you actually have to get that meal threshold right. So you would be doing yourself a service by getting 50 grams of protein per meal because you're going to get a robust response for muscle protein synthesis and anabolic resistance. Mechanistically, the body becomes kind of um, immune or desensitized to amino acids. So you require more amino acids at one time to get the sensing more robust. And especially in aging, like in the geriatric population, you need that sensing mechanism to be very robust. And that's where your amino acids come in and getting that, you know, amount per meal correct. So you overcome this anabolic resistance and to lead into resistance exercise, right? That is essential. And um, there's a lot of questions or someone, you know, if someone is aging, there's some great work out there from McMaster University. And they say, you know, they've shown that it's not the heavy weight. It's the two fatigability and exhaustion. That's interesting. It is interesting that they would get the same benefit because for a long time, I said, go out and work as hard as you possibly can until you want to quit at least twice or throw up. And that may not be the, the, that may not be a overarching recommendation. So really having a well-designed, trained program, you know, planned out program is essential and you'll respond quicker if you're under trained or, or detrained, right? And then the more advanced you get, the less gains you're going to make. But resistance training is key. I've heard it said, and this makes a lot of sense to me, that um, food are signaling molecules. And that's what I heard you just say, which muscle is that- Muscle is a nutrient sensing organ. Right, yeah. so the muscle is listening for the signal yes. of the food that I eat to say, ah, cool, there is adequate amounts of protein yes. available to me right now, and that turns something on. Yes, exactly. Um, and that would be the branch chain amino acids. As we age, the ability for that skeletal muscle to sense that 
decreases. Okay, sorry, and I know I'm derailing us a little bit here, um, but now going back to incomplete proteins like are found in, because one of the things you take the most heat for um, is you know saying oh, some of the protein that you're going to get in vegetable matter isn't right. going to be as complete. So, which what you just said would predict, which is that if the muscle is looking, it's sensing that right. signal, and the signal comes in the form of branch chain amino acids, right. and the branch chain exactly. amino acids from the vegetable matter keep me in some sub threshold yes, where exactly. it doesn't click over exactly. into this. That, it's not, you know, we use protein as a blanket term, but it's complex. You're looking at 20 different amino acids. It's not the protein that we need, essentially, it's the amino acid requirements that we have. And skeletal muscle has very specific amino acid requirements. To do the turnover. To do what is necessary. And to do turnover, to be able to maintain its structure, to be able to put on new muscle, to be able to maintain its health. This comes in the form of branch chain amino acids. As we age, the sensing mechanism of one, one of the branch chain amino acids, which we've talked about before, is leucine. That sensing mechanism decreases. The way in which we, which ultimately leads a less efficient turnover, leads to subsequent sarcopenia, a decrease in muscle function, muscle strength, muscle mass as we age, by optimizing for protein intake, you know, specifically high quality protein, then just like you that. said, <laughs> high quality protein is typically what we think about animal-based proteins. Does it just have to be animal-based proteins? No, but these are hard, fast. In the literature, high quality protein is defined by amino acid content. It's not a negotiable, nebulous concept. These are hard, fast biological numbers. And each protein has very specific roles in the body. And specifically as we age, and if you're thinking about famine and fasting, specifically as we age, the branch chain amino acids, in particular leucine, is required by skeletal muscle to begin that process. As we age, this concept of anabolic resistance meaning there's a decrease in efficiency, the body becomes- Do you know what's happening at the cellular level? Well, yeah. There's a decrease sensing of mTOR. Okay, and mTOR, um, which I understand vaguely enough to be dangerous, is uh, <laughs> basically what has to happen for us to grow. Yes, it's mechanistic target of rapamycin. There's mTOR1, mTOR2. And it's in all cells? It's in all cells. It's a... Will it happen differentially in different cells? It does. And it's stimulated by different things in different cells. And in muscle... Like what? I'm going to tell you. Break it down. Can't wait. In muscle, it's exquisitely sensitive to leucine. In areas like pancreas or liver, it's exquisitely sensitive to energy, extra calories. It's sensitive to insulin. Regardless of macronutrient. Mm -hmm. Well... Arguably, it would be more sensitive to insulin and glucose in, say, the liver or the pancreas. But skeletal muscle is exquisitely sensitive to amino acids. That sensing mechanism decreases as we age. So then this brings me to this concept of longevity, which is very hot right now. People talk about longevity, and there's this conversation of decreasing protein intake because that's going to help longevity. What's their hypothesis? I have no idea. It's because of this stimulation of mTOR. So they're worried about cancer? Yeah, they're worried about cancer. But if you were worried about cancer, and by the way, mTOR is signaled by exercise in skeletal muscle as well. So it's not an mTOR issue in muscle. Hello, my friend. You know that I believe success requires you to see failure as the ultimate learning tool. Success requires you to be disciplined and gritty and to never ever quit on your dreams. I say all of that because one thing is certain, the road to achieving your goal is not smooth or linear. I wish it was, but it's not. It's gonna be bumpy, sometimes scary. Some days you'll take two steps forward and slide 10 steps back. And that's why success also requires you to know how to pull yourself out of a rut and get unstuck fast. Life is short. You can't be messing around with your goals. You've got to make progress every single day. So I've pulled a class from Impact Theory University called How to Get Unstuck. 
which you can watch for free with the link on your screen or by clicking below. When you join me for that free preview of that workshop from Impact Theory University, I'm going to teach you my strategy for how to understand exactly where you need to be going, how to identify the obstacle that's blocking you, and the best way to make the most progress towards that goal and keep your momentum. All right, click that link and let's get to work. All right, I'll see you on the inside. But I, I just want to stay on this longevity topic of individuals saying you should reduce your dietary protein because of longevity, which that's probably the worst piece of advice I could ever give someone. Let's define longevity. What does that mean? Is it living from to 95 or is it living to 95 and a half? And the question is, do you want to be mobile and healthy or do you want to be frail and sarcopenic? If we believe in the hypothesis of anabolic resistance, which arguably we should, this is well documented in the literature, you look at my mentor's work, uh, Dr. Donald Lehman or Stu Phillips, any of these guys, Van Loon, you know, uh, this is a well documented phenomenon that as we age, our capacity to generate, heal, um, keep muscle goes down. So I just told you about the sensing mechanism and that we actually require more dietary protein. Really, we require high quality protein because we require that amino acid stimulus. So if you now further reduce dietary protein from aging individuals, and aging can start in your 30s, how are you going to then stimulate tissue? You have to be very careful about how you want to age and this concept of longevity. Longevity for a C. elegans or a fruit fly doesn't take into account the complexity as a human, human aging. Is that where they're drawing yes. that from? Yes, these are not human studies. You're not looking at randomized control trials. You're not looking at good high quality data to support a reduction in dietary protein. And as a trained geriatrician, no geriatrician says, hey. Study of old people. Yes, you, you need reduction to reduce your count. dietary protein. We know that skeletal muscle protects against disease. It protects against morbidity. It protects against mortality. Muscle is an organ system. It's an endocrine organ system. When you contract it, it secretes myokines. These myokines, you know, the, the most studied myokine is interleukin-6. goes throughout the body. It affects bone. It affects liver. It affects nutrient partitioning. What group do we put interleukin-6? Is that considered um, immune Cy response? It, so in, it is an immune response when it's released from macrophages. It is a myokine when it's released from skeletal muscle. I don't know what a myokine. You, you, you and yeah. I talked about this last time. I, don't, I still don't have my <laughs> so head the my, So this is, this is actually a newer science, and this really comes from the work of Pedersen, and she has essentially paved the way. She's an immunologist and internal medicine. And what a myokine is, it's a protein release from contracting skeletal muscle. And when we are deconditioned and when we are not training, you don't secrete interleukin. interleukin what do they stays. do once it's yeah. in the bloodstream? Well, it does, there's, there's thousands of them, which is interesting. D of different kinds? Of myokine, interleukin-6, decorin, irisin, there's thousands. Again, this is new emerging science and arguably what we should be studying. I'm starting to look at blood levels post-exercise in my patients. Right, And this just goes back to a broken obesity model, which we know you're not over fat, we know everyone is under muscled, right? When we're talking about the general population, you know, typically people don't have a good, solid foundi foundational muscular base. We, they don't. And this idea that we would further reduce dietary protein is going to have a much more negative effect. And the, Here's another yeah. question. Do you think there are problems with, so, cause I'm trying to get to, Muscle, obviously, hugely important. I couldn't agree more with that. It's just that makes so much sense to me. The question is what, and maybe it doesn't even matter, but which is more important, the, the muscle or the fat? So for instance, muscle. there is somebody in my life who is lovely, lovely human. They're really fucking strong, like really strong, but they're also morbidly obese. And so what is the muscle going to protect them enough from the obesity and the story I've always told myself is that because he has such a massive surplus of calories yes. and so much of it is insulin secreting that he's in a growth phase all the time. mTOR is just kicking off like crazy. But he's also eating too many calories. The muscle can only do so much. 
at so some there is point. a point at which the muscle just can't carry the burden yeah, of your diet. Yeah, yeah. You know, I and when I think about insulin, I think about when I think about carbohydrates, I think about it in a meal threshold, not in this 24-hour period. But carbohydrates are okay. You just got to make sure that you are not overextending yourself in terms of a meal per meal basis. Let's say someone has really, really healthy muscle, but they're over consuming calories. They're not going to have a chance. There has to be some, you know, there has to be some balance. But these issues start in skeletal muscle first. And I think that that's very misunderstood. Everybody is focusing on adiposity. Everybody is focusing on insulin resistance. And if you care about root causes, you have to care about skeletal muscle. So that's where it feels like it's maybe complicated. So um, if, if this guy who has a ton of muscle can still end up having the problem, it feels like muscle is necessary but not sufficient. You have to both have yes. muscle and a diet yes. that isn't overwhelming your system. Yes, it is necessary but not sufficient. I love the way you put that. And wouldn't it be great to see this guy lose some fat, yes. adipose tissue? And I think that that would make a lot of sense. You say that he has a lot of muscle, but what individuals that we see when we see MRIs or we see CAT scans, there's fat infiltration into skeletal mm. muscle. Skeletal muscle becomes marbled. You know, there's no free lunch or no free pass. Mm. If you struggle with obesity, it's not just limited to visceral fat. It does get into the organ. It does get into skeletal muscle. This ultimately affects it's this cycle. It ultimately affects your ability to manage you know, glucose, it affects your ability to manage substrates, it affects the health of the muscle. You know, we talked a little bit about myokines and, you know, the, big, the biggest, most famous myokine is interleukin-6. And when you contract skeletal muscle, it actually does this whole body crosstalk where it can lower some inflammation throughout the whole body, right? So exercise is in and of itself, I don't want to say anti-inflammatory because oftentimes the process of exercise does create free radicals, you know, there's this, you know, these, these concepts, like you said, are very complex. Yeah. It's not just this way and that way. And I think that we try to oversimplify it, but to the best of our ability, there are some fundamental things that are important to understand. And that is, we have to address skeletal muscle. You must. Get your muscle. And while I, I understand that it makes people afraid, it doesn't mean that it's true. Fear can be validated, but it doesn't have to be true. That's a really, we could derail this entire episode around that <laughs> sentence. But, um, but, but this I, is what's happening yeah. is that we're not having transparent conversations. Mm -hmm. And this is really what I'm fighting because for. Because of dogma, you're it's saying. It's because of dogma. It is, now I've been, I've been in this space for 20 years. 10 years ago, this was not a conversation. The sort of ethical thing. Animal cruelty, ethical kind of a, a conversation. Bad it, for the planet. It wasn't, it wasn't that way. And what's happening is that at the very heart is this anti-animal dogma. And there's nothing wrong with not wanting to eat animals. And there's nothing wrong with not wanting to harm animals. Okay? I, I can appreciate that. But what's happened now is there's not transparency around it. So this whole conversation then goes to, well, how can we get people to stop utilizing animal products? Well, we're gonna scare them. We're gonna generate so much fear. We're gonna put out fake educational documentaries. We're gonna completely obliterate the science. Do you think the they're science. wrong or sinister? It's sinister. It's, it's totally conscious. The people at the top, it's totally conscious. And then what's happening is then it's getting into um, you know, it's then training physicians and then it's affecting influencers that are then going ahead and talking about longevity and reducing protein. And they believe they're saying the right thing. They're not. They believe they're saying the right thing for yes. the body or yes, for the planet? for the body. But they're not understanding that at the very heart of that is, is actually coming from an anti-animal narrative. And what's happening is there's no transparency in the data. And our expectation is now to lower the quality of evidence to be able to say, well, no, plant and animal protein are the same. No, they're not. The last 20 years, this has not been a conversation. At the level of branch chain amino no, acids. No, or any amino acid. And there's this whole argument about it. Now it's, so now then it's the longevity piece. Reduce protein because it's going to affect your longevity. Longevity defined as what? Six months? 
And also, have you... But if that were the case, let's say yeah. that plant-based uh, proteins actually did make you live for an extra six months. That what would kind seem of muscle worth... mass would you have? Would it? Would it? Yeah, but if, if it seems to me that if it actually makes you live six months longer, that's worth talking about. But, but we don't know that to be the case. Right. I mean, uh, like I said, a fruit fly isn't the same. And, you know, I've taken care of people more than I can count at end of life. That last six months is brutal. So are you saying that what I'm trying to understand, because the analogy you always use is that what? It gives you six more months? If it does, I think we have to talk about that. But is your hypothesis that that well, data is flawed, you're looking at the wrong animals, in humans based on- It's about on... the quality. It's about the quality of life. Okay. And at the end are of life- Are you conceding that like, maybe it doesn't- It's possible. Let you live longer. It's okay. possible. I mean, Again, so you're not even going to argue that. Who cares about that? Well, now it's let's possible. Talk about you know, I'm never going to say, okay, well, you know, these are things that are highly complex. Is it possible? Maybe, but let's say, let's say, okay, that's possible. Towards the end of life, you want to be mobile. You don't want to have a broken hip and be spend the mm. last six months in a nursing home bedridden, or you don't want to spend your time in an Alzheimer's ward. These things re are related to skeletal muscle. Alzheimer's as well. There's a metabolic component to Alzheimer's. It's type three diabetes of the brain. If you care about Alzheimer's, you have to care about- Really fast, connect muscle to uh, metabolic disease for me. Exactly what's going okay. on. Okay, skeletal muscle is your primary site for glu glucose disposal. And but I that... use the term disposal to get it out of the bloodstream. Anything to get it out of the bloodstream. Word. So, right? So when you think about skeletal muscle, you have to think about glucose utilization or disposable. You have to think about fatty acid oxidation, skeletal muscle, healthy muscle, stabilizing blood glucose, which you've seen. So I don't get too much insulin secreted. So I don't get insulin resistant. And, that, and, that, and that's more of a dietary thing, right? So when you have too high of a glucose load, you're going to get a subsequent insulin response, right? That that is what happens. So skeletal muscle for all these ways in which it can help dispose of nutrients is really what we're thinking about when you think about metabolic syndrome. Ultimately, it is a intake issue. And I think that you- Meaning I could control it through my diet. You could, but you still want to have healthy skeletal muscle for all the other things. No doubt, and it gives me a lot more flexibility in my diet. Gives you flexibility, gives you, you know, there's mitochondria, it gives you a lot of positives. Okay, so now coming back to the longevity piece, we've got people and um, I'll be generous and say they really, really have amazing intentions. They want to protect animals. They want to protect the planet. Yeah. So then they let's don't just say have that. any evidence that it's better for us yet, right? Well, the if they can't, you can't now, animal protection is different than planet protection. And I think that we just have to be really clear. Animal protection is animal protection. All the other lines of narrative really go back to animal protection because the data doesn't support that you know it's just that these cows are now killing the environment right that's not true you know if we look at the u.s it's greenhouse gases industry transportation and electricity 50 percent of our fruits are flown in 25 percent of our vegetables are flown in so that it can't be so convoluted it has to be i think there just has to be transparent conversations when you talk about longevity i think we have to define longevity and we have to have these health conversations of what are the endpoints that we're going to be looking at. And when you say define longevity, I think it, your debate is maybe longevity isn't the right question, it's quality of life it is. is the right question. I, and I agree with, I, yes. And I, you know, I was thinking before I was coming here, you know, what is a different word that we can use? Because people talk about longevity, which is just the span of life, you know, and then there's terms thrown around like health span. I think, it really is about quality of life and it can't necessarily be. And a big part, uh, and I agree yeah. with this, but uh, so if I'm putting inappropriate words in your mouth, just tell me, but a big part of quality of life for you is really strength. Yeah, of course. And we know that to be true, not just my personal opinion. Of course, opinion. I think a lot of people don't really think about strength. Or they do you think will I'm crazy? when it starts to decrease. Mm. When you can no longer lift something up to put it in your overhead bin when you're flying. Or oh, you when can you fall. It's crazy it how as is. you get older, that's like the most dangerous thing you're gonna do is walk around. Right. But if you listen to the current narrative, 
that is going to be inevitable. And that's very scary. You know, this idea that we should not focus on skeletal muscle and continue to try to address obesity is a broken paradigm. We are focusing on the wrong tissue. Obesity is not the problem. It is not the root cause. It's skeletal muscle as a root cause. And diet, yes? Well, yeah. But they, the two kind of go hand in hand, right? Yeah. Because you can deal with more bad diet if you have more muscle. Yes, but you also have to nail diet for a quality of life going forward. Partly because I have this um, sensing organ that is waiting for a certain amount and kind of protein. That takes a lot of energy. When I say energy, I mean both physical, mental, and food-wise energy to maintain. Mm. It is not easy to put on muscle. You know? Facts. <laughs> I mean, I listened to Alan Argon. He's amazing. He would be amazing to have a conversation with. You know, I was asking him about how much muscle could someone put on in a year? And if you are totally untrained, you might get 12 pounds, maybe 12, maybe 24 pounds. That would be outrageous. 24 pounds. That would be startling. outrageous. You would look so different. But that would be outrageous, right? This is like at the absolute upper level that, you know, we don't really see happen. Mm. But the reality is it takes so much energy and effort. Again, I use those terms kind of interchangeably to actually put on tissue What's so cool about this organ system is that we can actually add to it. And I like to think about it as we add to it, we add to our life. All right, this is so powerful. Give people in like just one, a quick couple sentences, the thing they should be doing, whether it's diet, working out, whatever. Yeah, let's so that start with resistance training. You have to train hard. Whether you know, volume is, what's, it, what is what is important, but you have to get the volume in and you have to get the stress in. The body thrives under stress. There's this concept of we should have less stress, we should, no. Your body requires physical stress. After you get that physical stress, you know, whether you're doing high intensity interval training, you need to, re you need to train you know, resistance training, you need to strength train, and you need to do aerobic training. You do. And you probably need to work harder than you think you're working. I think you've said you need to feel like giving up at least twice and about to vomit. <laughs> and people will argue with me and say, oh, no, that's not true. Well, okay, but as you age, the tissue, it becomes more and more difficult to respond to. Mm. And number two, you have to account for your changing hormonal milieu. The body is changing, whether we want to believe it or not. When we are younger, we are driven by hormones. When we are older, older, 30s, 40s, we are now no longer driven by hormones. We are now driven by dietary sensing mechanisms. You have to account for dietary protein. You have to. Yes, you have to account for carbohydrates. Yes, you worry about insulin. Yes, you worry about fat. Yes, I do worry about total calories. But you have to get the foundational piece right up front. And that is high quality training is a non-negotiable. And number two, high quality proteins. Right now, everybody focuses on adiposity, being over fat. There's the constant struggle against the bulge, but that's the wrong way of thinking. It's not about being over fat. That is just the byproduct of being under muscle. So the true way to fix everything is optimizing muscle tissue and really changing the paradigm of thinking. It's not about being over fat, which is why it hasn't worked. It truly is from a metabolic perspective about being under muscle. So talk to me a little bit about um, when we look at what it means to be optimized for muscle mass, I get why being obese um, is wildly problematic. Um, fat itself is an organ. It's a sig it signals to the rest of the body. It's pro-inflammatory. Um, right. It can hurt joints just in terms of being too much weight. Um, one, why hasn't focusing on that worked? And then two, why is muscle the answer um, to the problem? Yeah, certainly. Well, it's kind of like what you focus on, you get more of. And by constantly focusing on the pathology of adipose tissue, it's the wrong perspective. And I think that that's largely what's wrong with the Western medicine approach. It's constantly chasing the outside pathology as opposed like to the really- symptom. Yeah, it's, it's a, and when you do that, you're constantly chasing your tail. But really, it's truly an issue of muscle tissue. So defects and issues with the muscle actually 
happen first. Adiposity is secondary. And how I really like to think about it is it's like a suitcase. Stuffing, you know, a whole bunch of stuff into a suitcase, which would be carbohydrates or glycogen and really overpacking it and then having things spill back out. And that's exactly. And then when it spills back out, that's when you get fat. All right. So, so you, I had an employee who used to be an Olympic level swimmer. And when he detailed what he ate, I was like, bro, you are going to die so soon. This is crazy. How are you not morbidly obese? He was like eating French fries and chicken nuggets from McDonald's and eating something like 12,000 calories. I could be a little off, but it was so absurdly high that I was like, this is insane. And he was quite lean. So mm -hmm. Is the hypothesis, the reason that he was lean, that he's using his muscles so much and he's in a state of burning the carbohydrates at such a ridiculously high level yeah. that he's sort of unable to put on the fat because the muscles are essentially taking care of it. And that's a really good framework to think about it there. That would be multifactorial. Certainly the amount of output that he has with all that activity, he's utilizing a ton of carbohydrates because he's a carbohydrate adapted athlete, as opposed to say someone who eats less carbohydrates and more fat. So the reason he didn't get fat was probably number one, he was young. His hormones were good, <laughs> right? High testosterone. And he was putting in so many hours that he was utilizing everything. So people have, I think, a high level understanding of there are three macronutrients and they probably have heard things like um, carbohydrates cause you to store fat and water, um, that the muscles burn um, glucose like at, at that level. Um, but my question is where it begins to get fuzzy for people is like what's happening when you use your muscle, like muscle mass, even just having it is right. going to be protective, is going to allow you to consume more calories without putting on adipose tissue. So I think explaining to people maybe the function of muscle as an organ um, yeah. would be really helpful. Oh, my pleasure. Probably my favorite topic. So muscle as your metabolic currency, it is largely responsible for your resting metabolic rate, which is really essentially the calories that you burn at rest. It is one of the largest sites for glucose disposal, which is exactly what you were talking about. Whatever a Twinkie diet he was on was being utilized by the muscle tissue. And another component of skeletal muscle is that it's a site of fatty acid oxidation. So we hear a lot about high cholesterol. Well, actually muscle is so metabolically active, that's one of the fuels that it uses. So truly the three components of muscle as a metabolic organ are Number one, resting metabolic rate. It determines everything about what you're doing. Muscle mass is incredibly unique in multiple different ways. You know, really not just as locomotion, which I think in our 20s, we all think about muscle as locomotion and looking good in a bikini or mankini, whatever you choose. But really the, the true essence and the true benefits of muscle are far beyond that. Just as its ability to utilize calories, utilize energy. And, you know, of course, we have to get into the topic of the importance of high quality protein, which I'm sure that we'll talk about. But muscle in and of itself is so interesting. It's actually an endocrine organ. So when you contract it, it secretes things. It secretes proteins. One of these proteins are called, you know, this group of proteins is essentially called myokines. So it's responsible for all those things that I mentioned, the resting metabolic rate, the glucose disposal, fatty acid oxidation, but also interestingly, just as you had pointed out of uh, the uh, fat adipose tissue being an organ, which is the nemesis of muscle, right? It's the nemesis of muscle. Muscle in itself, when you contract it, also secretes things. These myokines go throughout the body and are anti-inflammatory. Things like interleukin-6, BDNF for brain function. It's just multi, there's just, there's many, many. So BDNF is, is something brain derived neurotropic factor, if I'm uh, getting that right. So that's the, people have referred to it as sort of a feel good chemical. So you talked about muscle as an endocrine system for anybody that's not familiar with endocrinology, that's basically hormones. So right. um, is that what triggers the release of BDNF is the actual contraction of the muscle? I mean, it's certainly part of it, yes. And especially now, when you think about that balance of inflammation, Muscle also releases interleukin-6, 
which people always think of, you know, as the cytokine storm, as this interleukin that causes all these damaging things down the line. But truly, muscle as an organ secreting interleukin-6 actually has an anti-inflammatory effect. So walk me through then when my my tissues are at rest, um, the the metabolic rate is that the tissues are what, repairing themselves? Like how does They're that- just they're just very active. They're turning over. You know, they have mitochondria. It's just an active tissue. They break down protein, you know, build new protein. It's just this kind of balance between an anabolic catabolic effect continuously turning over. Okay. So anabolic being building muscle, catabolic being tearing it down. Um, talk to me because this is one of the things that ends up making muscle so critical for people to understand as they get older, more and more critical. You've talked about how muscle is basically a storage place for um, amino acids. Um, and I know that like if somebody gets severely burned, they almost can't take in enough amino acids. Um, as, as you get older, if you get sick, muscle, if I'm not mistaken, muscle is one of the like most direct predictors of mortality. Um, yes, and morbidity. If you want to survive, the more muscle you have, the more likely you will survive. So what I'm assuming that's like a, a form of catabolic where the body's like, yo, we've got a problem in, in the immune system. We've got a problem within the case of burns trying to um, replenish the tissues. So yes. what is the body breaking the muscle down into? So it typically breaks it down to amino acids. So it's an amino acid reservoir and those amino acids are utilized for fuels. And it's really a storage form and also, a, you know, it goes, there's other proteins in the body that may require it, but typically it's that amino acid reservoir. It's really interesting. So I've always, not always, but certainly in my, once I became aware of what's really going on in nutrition in the body, um, you recognize that fat has this incredible role to play, which is you can imagine us out foraging, hunting, and there's a period where you don't have any, and it's a battery. It's essentially like, hey, mitochondria is going to need it for the process of generating ATP, which is the energy that actually keeps the cells alive and allows them to function. And then so you're like, whoa, it's actually really powerful in a context where we can't just overeat, overeat, overeat. You get why the ability to store fat is this incredibly powerful thing. So I'm going to store basically potential energy. Um, fantastic. Literally, you're you're the first person I'm aware of to talk about musculature as a storage mechanism as well and being able to store um, many different things that the body ends up needing. Um, why? And you don't have any way you don't want to do that. So you don't want to rely on your store of amino acids. You don't you want to keep that muscle as healthy as you can for as long as you can. And that's really where this whole kind of question of dietary protein comes in. Because as we age, and just really overall, there's only two ways to stimulate muscle mass. And that's, I'm sure you know from the Quest days, is dietary protein, right? That's essential. And then resistance training. But in society right now, we have, we have really two fundamental issues. We have this fixation on obesity, and that is the pathology, versus the cure, which is under muscle. So that, that's one venue. And then you have this dietary component where people are incredibly confused about optimizing protein. Protein is incredibly emotional for people. And it's really the key macronutrient for maintaining muscle mass and also helping with obesity, diabetes, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease. These are pathologies. These are metabolic pathologies that can be corrected by having healthy muscle tissue. Modern diet has introduced just a massive amount of glucose into mm -hmm. the system. Our body has mechanisms or mechanism, we, we will debate, uh, for dealing with that once it gets inside the body. Those me mechanisms are evolutionarily selected for, so they're advantageous, but it is a very complicated dance. I've recently um, had uh, a couple different people on the show talking at this, the glucose issue and fat storage issue and insulin resistance from a really interesting angle. Um, so I feel like I'm beginning to understand how by having these constantly elevated levels, we mm -hmm. end up insulin resistant. We're not able to right. get the glucose out of our bloodstream, which causes a whole host of downstream effects, which we call metabolic disease. Um, okay, so 
Now we introduce your idea of muscle yes. being the, the organ of longevity and, and it being a, uh, an organ that secretes hormones. Myokines, yep. Okay, so the dance becomes, I can control my intake through glucose. You can control from a diet perspective. your insulin, or are you saying yes. just inject? I can control okay. my insulin through my diet. I can also though control my insulin response by you having muscle and using the life out of it because it will suck the glucose out of my yes, bloodstream okay. and burn it for fuel. I'm not yeah, sure what so, word. So uh, muscle, skeletal muscle is responsible for 80 some percent of glucose disposal. Okay. Yep. Now the final capstone to my thesis is, is so my thesis in a very um, simple sentence is, you are existing in this incredibly delicate balance between what you eat, mm -hmm. your insulin response to what you eat, and you, the muscle that you carry, and how much you use it. Yes. And so when I was first going through the things that you say about how critical muscle is, it begs the question that in a time of famine, muscle is actually dangerous because muscle needs this energy, it's gonna burn energy. And so if my response to fructose is to essentially become pre-diabetic, and that's good because it causes me to store a tiny bit of fat, to cling to the fat that I have, and to store extra glucose in my bloodstream, and that's what get, got us through the winter famines. Then I was like, well, wait a second, if muscle is yeah. this hungry organ, then it would be problematic. And then I thought, well, that's exactly <laughs> why we lose muscle so rapidly if we're not working out. When you think about, and there's some interesting concepts here. So the, the idea that in famine, the body tries to protect itself. You're essentially talking about a highly- Protect itself by staying alive. Yeah, highly now, catabolic, uh, no fuel is coming in. There's basic energy needs that we have. Skeletal muscle is one. Turnover in skeletal muscle is not great. Let's say it's a couple grams a day. Whereas Meaning I can't use it as quickly as I could it use It takes fat. longer. Muscle turnover takes longer. So the body goes through a- And I wanna push on that turnover. That word doesn't yeah, we're gonna immediately talk about click for me. Okay, we're gonna talk about it because it also brings up this concept of longevity. Is it gluconeogenesis? Nope, it is the replacement of body proteins. It is the regeneration, the cleaning house, and the replacement of body proteins, like liver goes through protein turnover, intestines go through protein turnover, bone. You know, like you said, there's a dance that's happening. And I was storing that in, so I'm, let's it's, it's stay in all, the context yeah. of famine if we can for okay. a second. So I don't have incoming nutrients or not very many. So I'm breaking down my muscle. To provide in essence, in part, the body will use that, those amino acids to protect your organs. Okay, so that they can have their turnover of cells, the yes. cells can die and be replenished with healthy, healthy new cells. Right, that is a non-negotiable. And not for uh, gluconeogenesis at all? Well, gluconeogenesis, the way in which I think about gluconeogenesis is branched chain amino acids or proteins in general can be utilized by the liver to go through a process of gluconeogenesis. And um, would that be happening in a period of famine? Or would I yeah. just completely shift over to ketone production? So over a period of time, eventually you would shift over to ketone production. The body doesn't wanna lose its skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is very important, but I will say yes. it's something that the body would give up for the other organ systems. Let me ask this. So as somebody who um, works out very consistently, but if I even reduce my intensity, my muscle, and, and don't change my diet, my muscle mass will begin to dwindle. So my body is, is responding, and my hypothesis is, that it's so afraid to carry more muscle than it needs, that the second I don't need it, meaning I'm not putting it under that level of strain, right. it goes, cool, I'm getting rid of. No, I would, I would, I, I would say that that is not a hypothesis I would go with. Cool. So let's take a 21 year old mm -hmm. since they are fucking just prime, man. So on the Twinkie diet and they're just right? jacked and jacked. Man. Yeah. I get it. So if they stop working out, can we not agree that they will lose muscle? Maybe not as fast as I will in yeah. my forties, but they will lose muscle. I would say yes. And why do you think the body does that? I think that the body thrives under activity. 
And whether you take a human, whether you take an animal, if you essentially domesticate them and they are not training, they will lose muscle. And so I have a theory that that's the body, the body is giving you a signal, which is these tissues are calorically expensive and it's dangerous to have anything that's calorically expensive. So with some wiggle room, if I see nutrients or demand mm -hmm. back off, then I'm going to shed those muscle tissues. But muscle we know is really, really important for longevity, yes. for morbidity and mortality. It Which is why you don't want to be in a famine you, or not using but the But I, I think uh, another way to think about it is that yes, it is a metabolically expensive energy driven tissue, it is, and it takes a lot of effort and energy to maintain that tissue. But I don't think it's the body trying to get rid of it. I think under well thought out conditions, training, increase in energy, increase in dietary protein, the body will do whatever it can to maintain that tissue. I do think it's interesting how you're phrasing it and how you're thinking about it, that the body would be trying to get rid of it. But I, I don't- Because we have to, I think we, yeah. I am almost certain that you and I agree 100% on how important muscle is. Like I'll say my hypothesis includes the fact that uh, if you wanna survive for a long time, you better have good quality muscle on your yeah. body. Because if you're right, that that's the store of these building blocks, then I wanna make sure that I always have that. And should I ever lose it, that I immediately, when that insult, whether it's the famine, a great illness, mm -hmm. or something like that is gone, that I rebuild that muscle. So if the nutrients stop coming in, the body goes, okay, whoa. Like this could, now that I have these very expensive tissues, I may need to prune them back, even though I know. Like, oh God, I don't want to do this. And I would really appreciate if you would. Or wait, can I, can I? Please, can I, of so, course. Or is it that because you're not getting enough nutrients, the rest of your organs need to function? So having a high amount of skeletal muscle that can be then utilized for the protection and the utilization and energy for all the other organ systems is necessary. Yes. Because now without the brain, without the heart, without the liver, without the kidney, it, a problem in those tissues will have an immediate effect. Will the body pull from, let's, so we'll come back to the famine in a second. Um, Which is not happening right now. It's not, and that's a big part of the problem, yeah. but for people, I think, to really wrap their head around what's going on. For a long time, for a, just an unimaginably long period of time, there would be periods of massive food scarcity. And so understanding the dance becomes interesting to me. So stepping out of the famine for a second and going back into what you're saying, so organs are critical and the body's gonna do what ever it needs to do to, to protect, protect that. So when the nutrients are coming in, we'll, my, I assume my body will preferentially choose to take the proteins, the whatever, yeah. from what I eat versus from skeletal muscle. Yes, yes. Okay. Right, so there are 20 amino acids, there are nine essential. You are going to eat those for, you know, based on a lot of the current research. There is some other uh, data out there that suggests that some of the gut microbiome may be able to scavenge for some of those essential amino acids, which is incredibly interesting. And how does it hand those off to us? As metabolites? Um, well, these are proof of concepts right now, and they're in rodent models. What is happening is what they believe is that when an individual is eating a very high fiber type, more veg vegetarian, vegan diet, that the gut mi microbiome can turn a bit into what like a ruminant would be. So that is one way in which some people can be able to get some essential amino acids. But I don't wanna go down that rabbit hole yet because it is still proof of concept, but sure. I, I do think it's very important. But going back to what you said about muscle and going back to what you said about famine, I think it's an interesting concept in the way that in my mind, the fittest, most muscular individual, the, the people that have the most muscle, are going to be able to survive because Here's, they're going to have more yes, of Yes, but let's talk about form. the myostatin gene. Okay. So the myostatin gene... And I have thought about this, it, and I'm not sure what to think about that, so... 
I have a I, guess. Okay, it's tell way me. less educated than okay. yours, but it's nonetheless a guess. Uh, so, for those who don't know what the myostatin gene is, the myostatin gene actually inhibits the creation of muscle. Yes. And if you break the myostatin gene, you get what they call double muscling, where if you've ever seen a double muscled cow, it's crazy. <laughs> they look they look like a bodybuilder. Yes. It's insane. Yes. And you get that, some people hypothesize that basically some bodybuilders that get to like an elite, elite, elite right. level have a way less active myostatin gene. And that to me is another signal that the body is like, I want muscle, but I can't just slather it on. Like it's, it's no, expensive it's a tissue. It's a difficult process and it is, we become forged by our training. We become forged. And when forged. you say it's difficult, Meaning? Meaning skeletal muscle is not an easy process to put on, right? The idea that we can just work out and put on skeletal muscle, people are different. This idea of being able to put on muscle in general, it takes effort and energy, meaning it takes physical energy. It also is an ex expensive nutrient process in the body, right? It requires a whole host of things to go right. It requires being able to trigger mTOR, subsequent muscle protein synthesis. You have to have the building blocks. You have to have the correct stimulation. Then you have to have muscle damage. Then you have to have rest. It's not necessarily an easy process. And the more well-trained you are, the more difficult it becomes to put on muscle. So by, you know, for you to maintain your muscle mass, you probably put a lot of extra effort into doing that and it becomes more difficult as we age because the skeletal muscle you know aging is a process and when we age things in general oftentimes become more difficult building muscle is one of those things the efficiency of being able to build muscle muscle as a nutrient sensor goes down its efficiency goes down insulin resistance in skeletal muscle goes up just part of normal aging whether you're training or not these are fundamental things that happen. Talk to me about the anabolic resistance. Uh, resistance. And, yes. and I'm looking at that in the context of um, insulin resistance. Is it the same where I've given it too much of something and the no. body's like, yo, back off? <laughs> no, but it's, a, it's an interesting thought process. As we age, the muscle becomes less efficient at utilizing protein. Muscle utilizes protein, obviously for protein turnover and for muscle protein synthesis, which is so valuable. You know, and oftentimes I talk about muscle as the endpoint and eating for muscle health. The reason, one of the reasons I talk about it is exactly for the reasons that you were talking about. If you can optimize for skeletal muscle, then the subsequent effects on the rest of the body, like being able to have proper tissue turnover turnover for liver and intestines all happen. So if you reach that threshold for muscle, which you're absolutely right, is a highly energy uh, taking process, the rest of the body is gets what it needs. So if you eat for high quality muscle, if you eat high quality protein, you create high quality muscle. So are those two things then just correlated and it's really the intake of the nutrients that matters? The intake of the nutrients absolutely matters absolutely matters. And when we age, anabolic resistance, which is def really defined as the efficiency of protein, the efficiency of muscle to utilize and sense protein goes down. Skeletal muscle is a nutrient sensing organ. When it gets enough of the amino acids, it goes through a process of protein turnover. I want you to, to literally be grateful and appreciative and and nourish every good choice that you make and let go of the bad ones. Because when we focus on that negative, when we just keep uh, berating ourselves, we can't go anywhere, we're stuck.